to the Journey of an Esthete podcast, a comprehensive examination of all things aesthetic, the arts, the humanities, and what it means to be human. things about you to start off. Um, oh, don't embarrass me. Well, it might. Um, I'm, I, feel, I feel very humble having you on this show, um, in part because, uh, well, in part because you're one of the greatest living filmmakers, um, but, but also uh, um, in part because uh, you're, you're, I think, one of the first guests I'll be having on this show, so um, that's really, that's really a a happy circumstance for me. So I'm honored to have you. Um, well, I, I'm happy to be here. Now you'll have 12 people. <laughs> okay. Um, I usual audience. <laughs> well, what, 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 what I want to say, though, is that I think you, I think, I'll say one, a couple things about you that you have made, I think, 40 plus features, um, probably more, and then many, many shorts since the 1960s. They're all completely independent. And the word indie gets thrown around a lot in a kind of not always accurate way because there's a lot of uh, indie films that aren't really indie um, um, because a film could be indie, you know, in a monetary sense, but be just like a studio, you know, cliche movie, right? Or the, or yeah. conversely, a movie – well, there are, sometimes studio movies are, are decent and are like an indie film, but there's a lot of confusion that – to me, you are the real article, real, a genuine independent filmmaker. Your films are handmade, handcrafted. Um, they're, uh, the budgets vary, sometimes small budget. And uh, they're all extraordinary films. Sometimes a small budget. <laughs> sometimes. Or maybe all the time. Maybe all times. Um, I, I, I have a technical question for yes, you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Just... To make sure your sound is working okay, because okay. I am getting something, uh, things will, uh, uh, as if there was a clipping going on. He says he's hearing a clicking. Clipping. Clipping. As if uh, the microphone were set or whatever, whatever it was, so that if it gets too loud, it chops it off at the end. Okay. I just want to know if you people are getting it at your end. No, it's. I don't hear it. Let it sounds know. all normal. Yeah, you for us, right. is everything yeah. okay? Or? Okay, well, this, if it sounds okay for you, then it's okay. Maybe it's on my end, but I don't wouldn't know. Let me see if I can. It could be my headphones have a clipping thing. I don't know. No. Oh, audio and video settings. Let's see. <clears throat> nope. It's not that. Oh, microphone. Okay. Adjust, automatically adjust microphone settings, so maybe then, okay, let me, can you, okay, am I okay for you now? You yeah. sound great. You sound really clear. Very clear. Okay. So, uh, to, ra to wrap up this in intro, uh, I think the first time, the very first time, I encountered your work was in the middle of the night on TV. And I think the movie was Rembrandt Laughing. Is that true? Was that? Yeah. I think WNET broadcast that's Rembrandt right. Laughing way back in. That's right. Eighty nine or something. That's like right, that. eighty nine, and that's the first film of yours I saw. And it was in the middle of the night. It was quite late, I think. 
And that movie floored me. It was, a, again, I was much younger then. Uh, it was a beautiful movie about artists living in San Francisco and also about one man's life. Um, and it was, it was just really unlike anything I'd ever seen. It was very beautifully made and it was um, engrossing. Knowing nothing about you, not even knowing really about a lot of the people that were in that film. At that time, I would not right. have known who Nate Dorsky was. Who's also a wonderful filmmaker who's in it. I did not, I didn't know yet about John English. I only became, he was a fine composer who scored many of your films of the 90s. I only saw, that's my first time. Including that one. Including that one, yeah. And um, it was only after seeing that film that I then went on to see some of the older things and then went on to see, you know, Bed You Sleep In, Surefire. So I've been keeping up with you to the present. trying to see everything that you make. Um, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a John Joss completist, as they say. So, um, so I, uh, I'm very happy to have you. So I thought maybe we would talk about um, things in kind of a linear chronology, if that's okay. okay. And sort of ask you about um, your, um, must have been an extraordinary um, youth, uh, because I understand there was, military family and involved in documentary filmmaking, right? The newsreel group. And then you started. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So maybe uh, you could talk about the, the, the changes or, the, or how you came to make the, the kind of films that you make and that, and that your journey in terms of doing that kind of politically engaged work and then personal films. And then at that <clears throat> time, um, how that, how that, how that, um, you well, know. let me start off. You want to go back to okay. When I grew up, uh, I had no interest in cinema at all. Uh, although looking back on it, I think maybe um, when I was in Augsburg, Germany, my father was stationed there as a military man, and for one year we lived at a, uh, in a German suburb that was mostly Germans. This was pretty much not too long after World War Two, and. Um, it would have been 52 or 3 that we were in Augsburg. And uh, because we were there, I accidentally met the man, the son of the man who ran a cinema in this suburb. Mm-hmm. And so I could go back into the projection booth and things like that during the Saturday matinees, which were usually dubbed American Western cowboy movies and stuff like that. Um I don't recall it at the time striking me, but looking way, way back through the other end of my, <laughs> my telescope, I go, well, maybe that was a little trigger. Anyway, um, I did grow up in a military family and moved around every two to three years. We got stationed somewhere else. And um, movie-wise, I began in 63 after two years of college where I had the slightest little grazing um, uh, acquaintance with movies, and particularly of the time American, whatever you want to call them, avant-garde experimental movies. I recall going to uh, <clears throat> Unitarian church basements for these screenings mm-hmm. in Chicago, and I probably saw, I know I saw Brackage mm-hmm. and Stan Vanderbeek and a few others, I uh, was not particular take, take, particularly taken by them. In fact, I remember as a very um, young man looking at some film that Brackage at the time was touting as the next genius in line, since he believed in geniuses. Mm-hmm. And I saw this, to me, rather dreadful uh, psychodrama, sort of Bergman-esque, lame psychodrama. And I recall walking out of the thing with my friends and telling them, well, if that's considered good, I'm going to get in this racket. <laughs> <laughs> true, true story. Well, I, I, think so, I, know, I think I know the film you mean, because I do know Brackage, and I've seen but, um So that was... Uh, it so wasn't one you, of his films. It was somebody that he was touting. Oh, interesting. I wonder what it was. Um, uh, I, the name long ago disappeared. You know, it, he, he did not become the next genius. I became, I believe, he became an advertisement maker. <laughs> okay, he went to Madison Avenue. <laughs> yeah. um, well, that's a th- that. Uh, 
reminds me that's a theme in some of your work is that is that part of America and culture um, certainly um, so I so that was so that gave you the inspiration that I want to do this or what was that is it something you said I want to I, I guess it was kind of a, a kick in the butt but very cynical you know I wasn't inspired I was like geez if that's considered good I can do better than that you know the usual Philistine yeah. thing about something <laughs> yeah uh, but I guess I must have known that it was sort of in my bowling alley here, certainly. Well, I probably fit that kind of thing. I think that was in autumn of 1962, and uh, I made my first film in January of 63. So I guess it had something to do with it. Uh -huh. what, was that, what was that film? It was a little thing called Portrait, which was shot in uh, a little town in northern Italy and was the a family had picked me up hitchhiking the year before and I wrote them back when I knew I was going to go to Europe and asked if I could store my footlocker in their house. They lived at the time in a sizable little farmhouse right on the edge of Milano but it was basically rural where I was <clears throat> and I wrote them a letter and asked them could I leave my stuff there and they said yes and uh, the first film was of their, at that time, 12-year-old daughter, Tilde, and uh, I had no idea what I was doing, but it came out to be an okay little film. The Netherlands Film Archive made an archival copy of it because the woman who runs the avant-garde end happens to be Italian, and I guess she liked it a lot. <laughs> well, anyway, that was the first. And so I guess, so you were, so that sounds like a, a more of a, a not so at least obviously political film, but do you want to talk about Newsreel or did that, when that happened? Or did, or? Well, Newsreel was considerably later. That was, Newsreel was after I got out of prison. Oh. Um, uh, I, may, I had made, uh, I don't know, remember, five, six uh, short films in black and white and uh, had already, before I went to prison, I was already a little name in the Chicago underground um, world, along with a few other filmmakers um, who never became major national figures. Um, would that, would that happen? Would, would, go ahead. Would, I'm sorry, would Robert Kramer or John Douglas be the, be the other, or no? No, no, they're, they're New Yorkers. Oh, okay. Uh, they, they came after, uh, you know, I, I had made, as I said, a couple hours worth of short films, silent ones, and... Uh, some of them were vaguely political, but it's kind of hard to be political while you're silent. <laughs> and, and I certainly didn't think of myself that way, but after I got out of prison in 67, and uh, both the civil rights movement was raging and the anti-Vietnam War thing had started to kick in, and I felt like I had earned the right to speak politically, having spent my two years plus in prison, <clears throat> and um, so when I got out, uh, I worked for the draft resistance at first, and then uh, in early, in, in the, towards the end of 1967, uh, Newsreel was begun, not like the New Yorkers would have it, that they started it, but actually it began spontaneously uh, in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Detroit, uh, Chicago, and a few other places where Basically, people all had the same idea of uh, using the media to to do resistance work, or whatever you want to call it. And it was then that New York decided to sort of centralize things. And New York, of course, being New York, overpowered everybody else. <laughs> there was a group in Ann Arbor also. I forgot to mention them. Well, I'm happy, anyway, so, I'm happy you're mentioning that because a, a lot of times there's a, there's a lot of, especially in the age of the internet, misconceptions yeah. about who did what and who gets credit. Yes. There's a lot of misinformation, so it's really important that you're on my show saying, hey, there's, there's this thing that happened in all these different cities, San Francisco, yeah. Chicago, and it isn't just these one person or two people in right. New York City, and that's important. Um, <laughs> is there anything else you want to say about that in terms of... Uh, uh, well, that, once... Once New York uh, sort of seized the reins and took over, um, the people the people there were pretty hardline political, I would say. 
Um, and uh, they tried to have artists plus the politicals, but basically the artists all either left of their own accord because they didn't care for the political stuff, or um, or they got pushed out. So it, it uh, I, I was of the I, I was on both stripes and have always been on spin. It's cost me a fair bit in my life mm-hmm. that I'm both political and artsy farsi. <laughs> Both. So I sort of don't sit on either stool comfortably, and most people in either cluster don't don't you know well that don't that, as- mm-hmm. associate with me. Well, that, that reminds me because one of the things I was thinking about your work when I was getting ready for the show, and this might connect to the point you just made, although you can tell me I don't know. You're one of the only filmmakers I I can think of who combines abstraction. Or sort of, you know, very intense and, and lyrical non-narrative filmmaking. Yes. With, you know, very good, strong, feature, dramatic filmmaking. And, and both in the same film. I, I don't think I've ever seen that, frankly. I don't know anybody else. I mean, it's just, I just, um, that's one of the things about you that's very unique. I don't know if that connects to, to that other point or not, but um, I just don't know. Well, I don't feel obliged to any formula. And the, one of the social, you know, in the art world problems is that, uh, uh, for example, I don't regard myself as, an, as a documentary filmmaker, mm-hmm. though I've made, uh, I don't know, seven or eight long documentaries or essay films. And documentaries definitely do not consider me a documentary filmmaker. <laughs> Just like experimental filmmakers don't regard me as an experimental filmmaker. So the narrative ones, narratives ones say my narratives aren't tight enough. I'm I'm a lousy storyteller. So interesting. It's, it's okay. Well, I'm su- I'm surprised. I mean, I'm not surprised. So you're saying there's very much a love for labels and categories and what box and all that. And so the the people that do documentary work, um, it's a. Uh, you're saying that's one of the problems in the art world overall, would you say, not just in film? Is that is that endemic to... Well, I'd say in, in general, probably just in the world, but certainly in the art world, you get categorized as this or that, and when you step out of the category, then it's sort of your, <clears throat> you're some kind of heretic. And <laughs> so so uh, I, it's been like that my whole life, so I'm, I'm, I'm totally used to it. I still find it a little bizarre, but, but um, I understand that's the way the world is. Well, it's interesting because you talked about the, the hardcore politics of the New York people. Um, yes. And I, I find, would you say that that politics border, was borderline, I don't know, I hate to put this, Was it? would you say it had quasi-Stalinist leanings or would that be too harsh or would you, I mean... Uh, within the range of what people at the time were, uh, yes, I would say the were, were, were American forms of Stalinist, the people who were behind that. But the American form of stuff, you know, they don't go kill people. No, of course, yeah. <laughs> that would be a real stall. Right, of course. Yeah, I mean. so, so this is, you know, our soft edge, you know, sort of authoritarian, you do what I tell you to do type stuff, which, needless to say, didn't go down well with the artists involved, who all, who, who you know, it was sort of like you file. Uh, an example is that Robert Kramer, in effect, was thrown out of newsreel. Wow. Because he made Ice, and that was a very, you know, a kind of personal film where he played the star and he, whatever, and he basically violated their communal um, rules, mm-hmm. and uh, therefore he got sort of dumped from it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, people will remember Ice. They don't remember, I mean, Ice will outlast. I think, uh, right? I mean, in terms of, as a document well, at that time. Yes, you know? most of the films that the newsreel made, uh, I don't think were, they, they were, let's face it, everybody was very young. People didn't really know very much. And, uh, for example, the people in the New York newsreel had this, you know, if Hollywood does it, we must not do it, view. So if Hollywood focuses, then God damn it, we're not going to focus. Or if Hollywood <laughs> records their sound well, then we're not going to do that because, because it's some form of cultural imperialism. And they were serious about that, and they made some dreadful films that way. <laughs> so, what well, can one say? It's funny yeah. because you're, you are an expert at sound and at image. I mean, you're, it's, it's, so it's funny to hear you talk about 
people dismissing the, the craft of those things. Um, uh, I, I, my, I feel my sound is my Achilles heel, but you know, I, lo I learned very early in the game making extremely inexpensive films that um, having some technical slop uh, doesn't matter as long as you've got something that grabs people by the heart or the balls uh, while they're watching it. So you can yep. be very crude and get away with it as long as you have something to compensate. You know, if you're just slick and you've got nothing to say, so what? <laughs> <laughs> and I learned that very, very early in the game. I mean, it was some of my earliest films. I saw that, oh, audiences don't care. I have one, a short film called Traps that was made immediately after I got out of prison. This was my first sound film. And you know, it's as crude as can be, but but it ripped people to pieces. And so I, I got I early got over this. Oh, you have to do. And I shot on film stock that wasn't supposed to be shot on. I did whatever I could to make the film, and it was technically completely crude, and tore people up because it addressed things that were going on at the time in a very hard, serious way. Mm -hmm. And so that, it, it was a lucky lesson for me to, to never get drawn into the, oh, you got to be technically perfect and all that stuff. And say, so, yeah, if you have nothing else, maybe you better be technically okay. <laughs> you don't need to be. Well, Which is shown, shown all over the arts elsewhere. So it was the beginning of something that continues, what you would say. But, but, but I'm, it's interesting to me because when you mention traps, I think of, of course, last chance for a slow dance. Yes, which is also very crude. It's crude, but I, what I want to say about it is that as a piece of filmmaking, it's it's extraordinarily beautiful. I just it's yeah. not it's just so well made, and I and I just, I just want to you know it's sort of I don't want people, um, and also that everything from what Tom Blair does to the other actors, uh, Marilyn, can't think of her name, that uh, the people in the film, and also that um, right. That extraordinary set piece with the Tonight Show and the motel and, and um, yeah, I don't think again I don't think anybody else was doing that at film in 1977 that I can that I can see or that I can. Tell I don't it's totally think anybody unique. else was either, but fortunately I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> but surely there was a design there. Like for example, one thing that I see in that film that I also see in Surefire, and Bed You Sleep and some later things are or. Stylistic things you keep coming back to uh, the use of two figures in the front facing facing us talking yeah. and doing conversation. There's that the way you use travel in your films, particularly whether it's the car, or whether it's the uh, or the way you should. One of the thing, other things I love very much, and I think you do this in the '90s as well. Some other films is the way you shoot around bars with your 360 degree. Yeah. To me, all that stuff is like bravura filmmaking. To me, it's like it's fantastic, and and yes, there's depth there. There's, there's meaningful content, and no, it's not slick, but it's to me, it's just so well done, and it's just um, I'm sure maybe hopefully people appreciate that, and and it's it's even more remarkable when you think about what your resources were or weren't and what you work with. Is there anything you want to talk about in terms of the making of Last Chance, in terms of the circumstance or leading up to it, or how that? Um, uh, okay, well, Last Chance, which was my third feature film, I believe, after speaking directly in Angel City, was made in the same year as Angel City, uh, which is a totally different kind of film. Oh, boys, uh, boy, Angel City is like this comic, yeah, it's a crazy, crazy film. Uh, well, Angel City was fully scripted, mm -hmm. except for one scene. Last Chance was half scripted and half improvised. <clears throat> anyway, um... Uh, the seeds of Last Chance was a two years, two plus years in prison and meeting certain kinds of people and uh, having hung around that aspect of the world for a while when I lived in Montana much earlier. Um, and the other seed perhaps was, <coughs> was um, Norman Mailer's book, um, the Executioner's Song, <coughs> which uh, I did read, mm -hmm. and I thought quite made an accurate portrait of 
the kinds of people who I had also met in prison or in my life in the seedy side of rural Montana for five years. <clears throat> and um, so it wasn't derived at all from that, but somehow something about that helped coalesce some ideas. Uh, once I had the idea of Tom Blair, I knew <clears throat> from having lived in Montana, and, uh, no running water, no electricity cabin with the woman and her child, Aaron. The woman was Elaine Ketchum, who died last autumn, I believe it was. <clears throat> um, and uh, Tom was the theater department at the local community college. And I basically knew him by going out to have a beer or getting together to smoke a joint. And I never, I never saw one of his productions at the school, which probably is a good thing. And I certainly never saw him play a Shakespeare part, which was probably even a better thing, because I probably would never have worked with him <laughs> if I'd seen him in some lame production at community college. Uh, at all events, uh, so I corresponded with him about this character he was to play. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have one. I just sort of we bounced around ideas. Now keep in mind this was pre-internet, mm -hmm. and I certainly at the time couldn't afford long-distance calls. So we were writing snail mail and sketching out ideas, and uh, he he was left a lot of room to do to help develop the character. Anyway, so I ended up with a piece of paper that had five or six little, okay, they're going to be seen, so this opening scene leads to, up to a point, I don't think I had the whole thing figured out when I started, which has become a standard practice for me now. <clears throat> um, I went up to Missoula, where it was shot in and around Missoula, uh, like a month before we were going to shoot and lined up a couple of local people uh, to be in the film, the person who plays the writer, I mean, the person who plays the victim at the end, who's a, a somewhat well-known writer, John Jackson. <clears throat> uh, let me see if I can remember who else. Uh, the, oh, the, the woman who plays the wife in the mirror has yeah. a sh fierce argument with, uh, with, she was a Hollywood, you know, Typecast as prostitute, etc. Kind of extra character. No, and I met her. She's a yes. wonderful actress, and I and that's I mentioned her. I think it was Marilyn. I forget her last name. I, I, um, the same person. I'm, I let me. I, I'm going to look it up right yeah. now, so I have these no, names up on my. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, and then of course there's the pickup of the motel. I mean, all the all the performances are so strong. I mean, you you seem to develop this way of working with people or actors, whether they're a non-professional professional, or just the performances. Um, well, I ha I to tell you the truth, I have no idea how it happens. I just know it does. <laughs> uh, for example, in that film, and and Last Chance was shot in five days flat, and. Um, uh, in that five days, of course, there wasn't time to rehearse or any stuff like that. It was just go, go, go. Uh, I, I picked the people. I, I don't really remember. I certainly did not audition them in the usual sense of having an audition. Uh, I had never seen Tom act before I said, let's do this. Uh, most of the other people I never saw act before I said, okay, you're in. And... Um, and then basically we did not rehearse and because I did not don't believe in rehearsing, especially improvising. I don't want them to burn themselves out. And uh, I'd have to say I really lucked out. But the flip side is I luck out every time. So I must be doing something. <laughs> I'm yeah. not certain what it is, but there's something. Anyway, well, it, so... Uh, it's, it's I mean, those decisions you made are, are still decisions you're making, and so yes. that's that's they're, so they're important. Um, you know about the no, wait, I, Yeah, I should I should say that before I began making features, unlike many people today, I'm going to give you the names of these people: Tom Blair, the guy who plays the hitchhiker, Stephen Voorhees, who died some time ago trying to rescue somebody who was drowning. Jessica St. John is the woman who plays the wife. That's who I was thinking uh, of. That's right. Wayne Krause is the guy at the uh, 
cafe in the morning. Mary Vollmer, who I hope to see because she happens to be visiting relatives up in Helena right now, uh, played the uh, pickup. And John A. Jackson is the guy who was killed at the end. He's written many novels. He's a detective better known in Europe than here. Liz Olson, Missoula. Anyway, um, you know, Last Chance is a big learning experience for me because prior to that with Angel City, I thought, well, the way to work cheapest is know what you're doing and do it. Execute it the first time around. So Angel City, I don't believe there were very many retakes in. There might have been a few, but I don't remember. <clears throat> uh, but it was all scripted. And I thought, ooh, that's, it cost $6,000. Um, last Chance for Slow Dance, um, uh, cost three thousand dollars and was half improvised. After that, I didn't script very much because <laughs> well, it was it was cheaper. It was it was more fun to do because I, I I much prefer the improvising, not knowing what you're doing, to having everything figured out beforehand. Then you just turn into a photocopy machine. And um, so ever since Last Chance, basically most of my films have been pretty fully improvised. Well, talking about Tom Blair, of course, there later on he he comes back in Surefire and Bed You Sleep In, and um, mm -hmm. and the, he, was, he was also with the film that I stopped. Well, two films that I stopped before there. One one we tried in South Dakota not too long afterwards after Last Chance, and it fell apart very quickly, and so we stopped it. The next one we tried uh, in Montana in at a mid early mid eighties. Mm -hmm. And uh, he became a little difficult. And his, when his sunglasses flew across the room at me, mm -hmm. I dumped him and never expected to work with him again. But <laughs> so you say there's a little bit of that character in Last Chance, the, the, the not so positive. Uh, uh, I don't aspects. want to say that, but yeah. he's he, he's a volatile yeah. Irish-blooded redhead. <laughs> Take okay. the thing as you want. <laughs> No, I just, I just don't know anybody. But, you know, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The reason I worked with him on Surefire is because somebody who I'm not going to mention, who was an erstwhile producer, really wanted me to work with him, and I said, "Go ahead and ask him," and just assumed that he would say no. Hmm. And he said yes, so I was stuck with working on Surefire. He was uh, not exactly. Uh, cooperative. I, it was a totally different film that I intended to make because he he and he got the other actors to insist on the script when I didn't want one. So I did what I could. <laughs> so you're saying there was a, there was a kind of a struggle over the over whether to use a script, and he had in, he he sort of wanted. To... Well, he didn't want to improvise, huh. and the other actors, because he's a very powerful person personality or something. He's, he's, he's an actual, absolutely wonderful actor. Oh, he is wonderful. Very, di but I'm very disciplined. Very, I'm very puzzled good. because his improvisation in Last Chance is, is so good. So is it that he doesn't like doing that? He clearly can do it. I mean, I'm, it's just puzzling to me. Uh, I, I can't tell you. I mean, yeah. on one level, I would think he was getting revenge for me having fired him on the previous attempt. Yeah. So if I said let's do this, he said nope, let's do that. Uh -huh. And that you know, I intended. To, do you remember way back then there was a film with uh, there was about a singer. What was its name? A country western singer in Texas, done I think by an Australian director. You mean Bruce uh, Beresford? I'm gonna forget what it's. It was a very low key movie. Tender Mercy. Thank you, Mercies. Yes, and that, that was what I wanted to make something where my style was as invisible as that. Needless to say, Surefire is not at all like that. It's no tender mercies. <laughs> and, and it's because, because neither Tom, and then once he said that the other actors followed him. So I didn't write it. I'd sit there and say, well, here's a scene. You want it written? Sit down and write it. Hmm. So basically, you know, I would guide the writing, but it was sort of like they wrote it because I didn't want to write it, and uh, but I knew what I wanted to say. So it was a weird movie. Uh, I, I, to my mind, I don't regard it as a good movie. It has too many very deep flaws to me or things I don't like. Mm -hmm. uh, but the flip side is another one of these things one learns about the arts in general. Um, 
despite all its flaws, is an extremely powerful film. <laughs> so, but people often mistake power for good, right? So, huh. you can make, if, so you can make something that's really powerful, that's full of flaws, that wipes out the flaws, but uh, the flaws are still there. And for me, Surefire is a film with lots of flaws in it that I only was able to... I refused to look at it for a year How, after well, then I shot I, it because mm -hmm. I, I, I was so repelled by hmm. what had happened. And then um, uh, I think I can safely say I'm a good editor and I rescued other people's stuff as well. So I took it, what it was, a, to me, a, a, a not a good, you know, a mess and managed to do some editorial things that turned it into something else. But what is your verdict then on Bed You Sleep In? Because that's close, isn't it, in time? And, and, um... It's close in time, yeah. relatively close. The Bed You yeah. Sleep In was, the, was, as much as I can call it, the film I set out to make. I did get the resistance from the actors. I got them to do what I wanted to do. Well, it shows. And, yeah. and, you know, but keep in mind, that once again, I improvise, so I don't come into a movie saying, this is what I want. I come into a movie about, here's the pieces I have of my puzzle. I have a place. I have characters who fit in that place. I have time to shoot, and I'll find out what comes out when we're all finished. I do not have, a, none of my later films have I had any idea what they should look like. I don't think, uh, you know. It's all an organic process, and there is no script. There's no, oh, I didn't make the movie I wanted to make, because when I begin, I only have a very vague idea about what I'm trying to do, and the making is I know what I want to make. So you're, you're no, saying... I, mm -hmm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So you're saying that the process itself is... is um, the doing of it is, how you, is, is what you... intent is the intention. That be a way to... Well, okay, you play music, right? Yeah. Okay, so my view is I'm a very experienced um, jazz musician. That's right. Of the improvising sort, um, who knows about everything I need to know, and if you and if I have the thought, hmm, let's play something around X. If you were jazz musician, be around this tune. Well, that's what right? I do. That's what I did in the uh, film you made in me. That's it. we did it. Yeah, right. it's, yeah. So yeah. try to imagine. Uh, it's a little more. On one level, we say, well, it's a little more complicated if you're making a movie that's narrative, that's this, that's this, all that. But my view is exactly the same. It's like, okay, I'm going to play my instrument, the cinema instrument. I have my notes, my actors who are notes. I have my theme, which is the vague idea I have in my head. And um, and then I begin to play. And I don't, you know, I, yes, I know how, I, I know what I'm going to play in the sense of, as you as a jazz musician, you know your riffs. You know them inside out and backwards. You can play them upwards or backwards. You can put one hip here or one over there. You can, juggle all of this, but it's still going to be in the language that you know, right? Yeah. And my language is cinema, and a rather broad range of what cinema can be, from experimental to narrative to non to non narrative, other qualities that are, uh, for example, um, a scene that sticks out in the bed you sleep in that many people mention, and that they sort of like, well, it, it isn't there narratively. And I say, well, it's, it's correct. It's not there narrative. The scene in the cafe where the camera makes a rather uh, elaborate camera movement. Well, that's, that's, that, like, that's what I was talking about before, because that's a theme in all of your work. That's a very, that's a something that you do. Well, it's something I do, yes. And, and it's, one, <laughs> it's one of the things in your films that I love, absolutely love. And I actually think in my more... Um, kind of more uh, weeds moments or more kind of, uh, I actually think they, they fit. They have something to do with the rest of the work. I don't actually think that they're incongruous at all. Oh, no, no, they're not. They're at least arbitrary. Yeah. But because they don't work the way narrative, they work more like music. Mm -hmm. It's more like, here's a passage in the music. No, you could you yank the music apart. And let's say you have a symphony. And take this passage or that passage. All of them don't mean anything, right? Mm -hmm. But someone is musically orchestrating them, so we arrive here, 
you get this passage that has this quality to it, and then you move on. And for me, I guess it gets tricky because, you know, it's sort of a, because there is, say, in The Bad You're Sleeping, yes, there's a narrative, but it's not a conventionally made narrative. Everybody needs an anchor in life. You, me, just everybody. Anchor made this whole show possible. I'm immensely grateful to them. You too can use Anchor to make your own shows and create your own vision. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Thank you. And so it has passages like when he goes fishing and we just go over the water mm -hmm. or, or in the cafe where the camera is doing its own seemingly autonomous thing. Um, but they all stitch together. They all do have a, uh, I don't like to use narrative because people think it's too narrow a description. They all have a, a, in a sense, a, a musical reason, not because there's music with them, but, but there's well, a passage is. that does this. And so when he goes in the cafe, for example, yes, the character is there. He's just chit-chatting with somebody. There is no narrative meaning to that. But it puts him in his community. Mm -hmm. And or when he goes out fishing, it puts the shot over the water is it puts you in his environment and his mental space. And with, yeah, that's, the same, that's the same thing you do in slow moves, right? With the observatory or the camera obscure Correct. passage. Correct. Yeah. yeah. In slow moves, there's, yeah. a, there's that or uh, the riding along. But when I went out to the Delta, and there's with the trees mirrored in the canal, mm -hmm. which just, there was no intention to do that. We went out there and it was a perfect shot, just stood staring me in the face, so I jumped on top of the Pontiac hood and we shot it. <laughs> well, uh, to backtrack a little bit, you mentioned Angel City was before Last Chance. Yes. And then you made Chameleon, and I, I sense a kinship between Chameleon and Angel City. Um, More well... Yeah. The kinship is Los Angeles. That's right, oh. in the 70s. Did you <laughs> want to talk about that period or, 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 the, or, the, the, and then, or that house that you shot in in Chameleon or some of the things of... Well, things? I lived in L. I moved from uh, rural desolation and destitution, uh, five years in Montana with no running water, no electricity. I moved to uh, near a beach town in Southern California and inserted myself into Los Angeles. Some people who worked for something, I think it was called Focal Point Films, which was a political filmmaking outfit. I don't remember who introduced me to them. And they loaned me their Aton. And uh, I had written not long after I got to uh, California, uh, the script for Angel City popped out at me. It was based on a, a scientist I met who who was at UCSD, uh, who was a very strange, interesting guy. And my character was rooted in him, and I was going to have him play it, and it turned out he couldn't act his way out of a wet paper bag. So I met Claudini. Uh, but I was able to immediately immerse myself into, from, from uh, living out in the woods in Montana into hardcore Los Angeles, Southern California, uh, probably having to do with my upbringing as someone who moves around a lot and just adapts to wherever he is. Um, and Angel City was uh, my, you know, it was all written aside from there's one place where the actress is doing a, an audition. Mm -hmm. And part of that was scripted and the rest I played, the dictatorial Germanic director off screen, that's my voice, mm -hmm. uh, telling her what to do, et cetera. Um, and then it came, because of Angel City, I met some people and they said they could get money easily, which they couldn't, uh, and we, and uh, Chameleon was completely improvised, um, uh, with Claudini, once again, and, uh, it was so improvised that the last line of it said, it's got nothing to do with art, really, mm. uh, 
I think that's less, it got nothing to do with art, pity, just life or something like that. And that was because the two people, erstwhile would be producers, were such um, incompetence coupled with so sticking their nose in. So, so they made lots of problems, and making the film was a very unhappy process for me, and uh, which to me shows in the film. Hmm. Um, uh, it depends on my mood when I, when I watched it afterwards, you know, whether I really don't like it or I overcome my, oh, I really didn't like making it. <laughs> Sometimes it seems like a reasonably good film, but other times I hate it. But it has mostly to do with the, the process of making it and what happened. Well, you know, there's an intimacy in Chameleon. And there's, there's what? A, there's an intimacy in Chameleon among yes. the actors mm -hmm. that really is... Um, but then again, there's that in the later, in, in the, so, and that's that must have been a positive thing, right? This, in that woman's house when he visits, and then the thing in the field. Right. You know, they're talking the the woman. Stuff. The woman was a a friend I met through political through an old girlfriend uh, from Chicago who was deeply political, and she was somebody she knew and introduced me to her. And when I first asked, "Can I shoot in your house in Angel City?" It's in her house. The first time I asked, she was very hesitant and said, nah, I've had people, I've had crews come and shoot and trash my house. And I said, I'm not a crew. It'll just be me and my, my actors. And I guarantee you, you won't even know we've been here. And when we shot in Angel City, that's the way it was. And then the next time around, she said, oh, okay, no problem. So it was no problem shooting in her lovely Beverly Hills, quasi Mesian house. Um, or let's see. I would say you said the thing in the field. We were going to go shoot that out on the bluff hmm. in the Pacific Palisades. And as we were driving there, the sun was going too fast. And I said, "Let's. We have to pull off and shoot this now." Hmm. So we pulled off to a place I'd never been to before, up on Mulholland Drive, and it was a perfect setting. And we got our scene. <laughs> It's called improvise. <laughs> well, that's that's what we've been talking about. But this your face, yeah. yeah and it, but it, so I remember the first time I met you, I, I carried. A, remember in Boston, I was carrying a Rembrandt laughing. Uh, yes. In, uh, to a screening of that, and I remember you said something. Uh, I think that was the moment when you gave a lecture about the importance of digital and changing technologies and film and. Yes. And I remember that so. Do you want to talk about that transition or the change in period, or did you want to talk about Vermeer's before that, or you know what do you think is? Well, we a, can talk about Vermeer's first if you want. I mean, uh, the, uh, the, the Vermeer's was the first time I actually had money. I had a little bit of money for Surefire, but not no. You know, I think it was seventy thousand dollars or something like that. <clears throat> um, in Vermeer's, I raised all the money by going to, uh, I was living in New York at the time, and a friend of mine, Jim Stark, uh, who was Jarmusch's first producer, has done indie stuff ever since. Um, uh, I talked with him, and I, somebody I knew had, had gotten a, made a film uh, with uh, the PBS thing, American Playhouse. Mm -hmm. I remember that. And, uh, and, and Jim said, don't even bother. They're totally script-driven. And, and my view of when I'm told, don't even bother, I said, well, the worst, the worst case is they say, fuck you. Mm -hmm. So what? Uh, I've heard fuck you a million times. <laughs> I don't care. So I went to meet a guy, Lindsay Law, uh, and told him, well, I have a film in mind, but I have no script, and I'm not going to have a script. And it'll be about... Uh, the first stock market crash and tulip bulbs in Holland in 1640s, 50s. Uh, it'll be about all the Vermeers in New York. He painted in the same period, and there's, I think, five Vermeers in New York. It'll be about the art market crash, um, which was going on then. And all these things mixed together. The history of New York coupled with what's going on now, the social milieu, ambience of the art world, etc., coupled with the stock market. And that's basically all I could tell. 
I said, there isn't a script. There's not going to be a script. And uh, so we shared a beer. And then I went back and had a beer with him a couple of weeks later. And I got $240,000. Hmm. And uh, with no script whatsoever, which is totally, totally, totally unheard of. <laughs> and then it was funny. So it, it was their bottom of the barrel budget. It's like absolute lowest they could imagine somebody making a movie. And I shot in 35 millimeter for the first time. And people I knew said, well, you need a cameraman this time, John. I said, why? Hmm. You know, a 16, 16 millimeter, it's a narrow gauge. The optics of the lenses are different, but it's just a camera with film in it. It's just the same. And uh, I said, no, I'm going to shoot it. And uh, I did need an assistant to do focus pulling because in 35, that becomes optically a necessity. And uh, otherwise... You know, there was no big deal. He said, oh, you use lighting this time? I said, I've never used lighting before, and I'm certainly not going to use it now. <laughs> Films. They said, oh, but you need lights in 35 millimeter. And then in the back of my head, so I said, you know nothing about film. Because being in 35 millimeter has no more need for lights than 16. The emulsion is the same. The speed is the same. Everything's the same. It's just bigger. Oh, but you must have lights. <laughs> All, uh, and all the Vermeers has no lights used in it. So. Um, it looks beautiful and stunning, and people are always amazed. Oh, you must. But I remember taking Lindsay, I couldn't, you know, I wanted him to come and watch some shooting or something like that, and he just didn't have time. And I did one time get him to come and look at some brushes, which were the ones of the camera going around the columns in lower Manhattan. And he, his comment was, well, it looks like you spent all day setting lights and got your five minutes. How did you and shoot in that? How did you shoot in that museum? The tech, the tech, the museum. In the Met. Okay. Yeah. It, it was, it was the Met. Uh, we asked permission, got to shoot on a, on a, a Monday, which is members only day. And uh, so it was just me and camera person and a sound person and uh, the actress um, and it was you know uh, we were in and out in 90 minutes and shoot, shooting at the end when the camera goes up the stairs of the Met uh, that was in effect illegal we came and set up a jib on with no permission no cops no nothing set a jib on up in the public busy public sidewalk space right in front of the museum <laughs> Did a dry run with a super, uh, 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 an eight millimeter video camera, just to make sure it looked right. Uh, hailed a taxi and told the actress, have him come down and pull over here. He didn't know he was in a movie, the cat ta taxi driver. <laughs> Again, That's fantastic. Improvising, very hit run. And, you know, it was, legally we were supposed to have a permit to do that. And they would have blocked the place off with cops and all. And I set up the jib arm because I'm the grip too, just like I was on this shot and the day you sleep in this complicated thing with tracks. I set up the tracks because nobody else knew how to do it. And, uh, you know, but I could put up the jib arm in two minutes, do the practice, say, let's go. And then we were in and out of there in probably 15 minutes. We had it up and down and got our shot. Um, yep. Anyway, Vermeer's is a SAG movie. So we had to follow the union rules. And, um, for example, one of the union rules is every actor has their own dressing room or some such crap like that. So when we'd go into a place to shoot, I'd say, the bathroom is yours, and the, that bedroom is yours, if there were such things. And I think several times SAG went, came by to check us, but we'd already shot and gone before they arrived. Because mm, they assume you'd be there eight, twelve hours, and we're there for two hours. <laughs> so that that anyway. makes me that of course makes me think of music, uh, John English, uh, yes. that, that that fantastic score, and his the jazz influence in his writing and his acting and Rembrandt uh, laughing and of course your your singing and songwriting. Did you want to talk about doing songs in your own films or talk about John English or music and <laughs> anything that? Um, well, I, I just do stupid country western and when I make films where that's appropriate. I don't mind throwing them in. Uh, Last Chance has them. Slow Moves has them. Uh, Bell Diamond has a little mm -hmm. 
slide guitar riff that I did that then John played with on the, the old technology of uh, tape looping. <laughs> Back in the day of tape looping. Uh, and otherwise, in general, uh, I guess my view of music is not normal for filmmaking. I, I do not use music to support scenes with acting in it. Uh, the music is almost autonomous with the visual thing made to take the music, like this, the sweep on the floor. And, uh, there's a place where um, all the Vermeers are goes across uh, 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 a marble floor, or the one where it's going through the columns um, uh, in, the, in the bank building in the lower Manhattan. Those were all things that I did the shot with the intention that I didn't know what music, because the music wasn't written then, uh, that it would be to contain some music. And people say, well, why the shot of the columns? I said, well, because that's where this, my character walks every day. Right? I don't show him walking through it. That's what gets people confused. Why do you find the shot of the columns? I said, because that's, that's, where, that's where this guy lives, right? He lives in that yeah. world. So I'm showing, I don't need him to walk through it for you. <laughs> well, you do, do you think people are kind of a little bit on the nose or flat? Is it that they don't, is it, is it that they're not, um, but well, I mean, I there's, there's so much to talk about, I mean, because, uh, uh, so you're the, you're the Bresson school in terms of music, right? In a way, but, um, and other things too, but, um, but there is a very strong score in, Vermeer's. It's like a big band. It's a large ensemble. Oh, yeah. Well, I didn't think I had a film until he did the score. Huh. And I'd say without the good score, I probably didn't have a film. You know, I, I shot in order to contain the score. I, I John had done a handful of films for me. I don't know, three films for me by then. And he is a jazz musician. That's his thing. He can play multiple instruments and composer. And so I knew it was going to be jazz, which was certainly appropriate to New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just shot visual passages that would contain jazz that I figured, well, this will. But then he did some music where I originally didn't intend to have music, but I'm very open. I said, well, if you can see any place here where you think. So, like, for example, when they're in the Met Museum at the Vermeer Room, uh, there's very beautiful cello music there, if I recall. And uh, uh, primarily cello and some of this later on, there's some horns and everything. Um, and I didn't intend to have music there, and then he put, wrote it, and I said, oh, that's perfect, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. So, so um, then again, I have my own ideas. For example, the, the film begins with the shots of New York from way up high, some rooftops in New York, and there's the sound of sirens and stuff like that going on, it's all played with instruments. And that was my idea. I said I wanted it to sound like the street sounds of New York, but played with you know, with instruments. And so it's a very collaborative thing. Uh, but in that, you know, the, his, his lush score, which was, uh, it was a jazz ensemble of 18 people. Mm -hmm. the, I think it's called the Bay Area jazz composer or something or other. And we recorded that in uh, in uh, the George Lucas thing at Skywalker Ranch, up in, up in this fantastic recording thing that can hold two symphony orchestras and has a screen big enough to see Star Wars properly. And uh, the, mixing, the mixing console had 128 channels, which looked like an aircraft carrier. <laughs> And uh, and uh, we were paying a hundred dollars an hour <laughs> uh -huh. because because if if Francis or uh, one of the two or three Bay Area filmmakers weren't using it, it just sat there empty because nobody ever wanted to drag you know a symphony orchestra up there because it's like thirty miles north of San Francisco. So we sit empty, and one of uh, John or somebody who worked there and. Got us in for a hundred dollars an hour for probably one of or the most sophisticated sound studios, recording studios in the world, which was a treat to give the players because they had never been there. So they were a little dwarfed by it. We had 18 people in this thing for mm -hmm. could hold 
honored. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure John Thanks. English lo loved that. And again, I want to say he, he's greatly missed. Uh, rest in peace, John yes. English. He was a wonderful musician, a composer, and uh, yeah. and uh, was that his yes. uh, probably his first time in this, in that kind of architecture and that obviously the, I think yeah. that was the first time he got to play to compose on such a grand scale you know, to, to do an Ellington scale mm -hmm. you know, uh, band so okay we have space to play uh, yeah no I love his, his recording for that was fantastic he was supposed to do Surefire mm -hmm. um, but he I, I wanted Steel pedal and country western, mm -hmm. and he 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 wrote a, a kind of theme thing, uh, and then said I can't do this. <laughs> so I got another. I got Early Bold, who then has done a lot of films for me since, and uh, uh, and John did uh, my Italian film Uno a Te, mm -hmm. and he wasn't well enough to do the bed you sleep in, mm. so. Early. Well, I'm thinking a little bit about how some audiences don't understand why you shoot something, even though your your character lives or is where the where the landscape or environment is. Um, is this connected to your interest in Go at all, in terms of? Because uh, I know you mentioned that Go is important yeah. to you in your film. Well, uh, first off, uh, I I think most most. People in my society, even in Europe or here, you know, are so well trained by mass media of what they expect a narrative to be. You know, they basically expect to be led by the nose. That a, a does this to B, B does this to C, because blah 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 blah, and they want all those linkages explained to them, right? Like, okay, and I. I have no interest in doing that whatsoever. Uh, my interest is in getting people to think and feel on their own and not make them figure out, oh, not, not rub it in their nose, here's the logic of this. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you brought up the go thing. Yes, when I, just, when I make a, a rough analogy to how I approach narrative, aside from saying, well, I approach it like it's music. Right? Mm -hmm. It has a movement, it has a flow, and it arrives at some kind of conclusion. It doesn't have to be a climax. You can conclude music another way. <laughs> and, uh, and so that mentality of composing it more like music, uh, coupled with, uh, I would say, most of us, most of people in my society are accustomed to things like chess, like football, <laughs> like Okay, we have a line here and a line here, and this one has to crash the other uh, line. That's how we organize things. That's how we perceive things. That's how we perceive narratives, whether we're conscious of it or not. That X does something to Y, that blah, 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 leads to conclusion Z. Mm. And there should be all the linkages, and sometimes they make it difficult to figure out those linkages, but if, if as they critics say, they didn't wrap up all the loose ends. <laughs> Mm -hmm. as, if, as if life wraps up all its loose ends. <laughs> right. uh, and so my view is, okay, we tend to perceive things like chess. We have a, a line, a conflict, and this cuts through the line and goes there, and we get a touchdown. Hey, hey, hey. Well, my view is more like go. And I, I think I originally got this thing because long ago, during, at the end of the Vietnam War, I read a little short book that compared American military strategy uh, in Vietnam, saying, well, we were playing chess and they were playing Go. And we were always wondering, why are they behind our front lines? <laughs> Their view was, there aren't any front lines. <laughs> so I regard the way I construct the narrative mm -hmm. subconsciously. I don't think about this when I'm doing it. Right. It just happens. Um, is that I feel like I'm playing a go game, and I'll put down one piece, and then I put down another piece, and like a good go game, if it's really good, you the the opponent will won't understand why you're putting this piece here or that piece there until it's too late. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, oh, there's there's a mathematical logic that was there and was very carefully masked, which is like the inverse of 
our sense of narrative, where you should reveal the steps as you go along, or if you're a little bit intellectual, you might scramble them a bit, but you still want to reveal them. But mine is, like, I put this piece down, then I put a landscape thing down, and then I introduce a character who's not having to do with the character you already met, and I put down a bunch of pieces, and only at some point when I, my logic is, is enough pieces there to say, okay, now I'm going to put down a piece. So on the bed you sleep in, it's, okay, now I'm going to put down the letter from the daughter. Mm -hmm. And so sure, she accuse her, accuses her stepfather of a, a possible sexual molestation, mm -hmm. which I should, I should point out, most people take my bait completely mm -hmm. on that film and look at it and say, oh yeah, he did it. Whereas nothing in the film says it shows you that he did it. There's merely an accusation from a daughter. Right. A daughter who, if you're watching carefully, may be in a shot when the, her boyfriend calls up and says she committed suicide. It's in a shot. He's, he's transparent against some uh, some uh, the smoke from the pulp plant. And in the corner, there's this other figure who looks up at him after the, he finishes writing. I don't know if it's her or not. I told the actors, I don't know, but I'm not. <laughs> and... Uh, well, that's that's really interesting because that I feel like that you're moving towards something with that film. The technological thing I mentioned earlier that you gave this speech that I was present. You said, you know, filmmakers, you must. And you know, the the films I'm thinking of off the top of my head, Coming to Terms, They Had It Coming, Homecoming. Yes. These films are in this new period of working. I have a thing about coming. <laughs> well, I don't. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. But they're but they're um, they're in this period where you you mastered and seized these new technologies and, and and I have to say that these films are the best you've ever you've ever done and they're and they're recent films. Is there anything you want to say about working in, with with these new uh, these new technologies if that's what they are these new methods or these? Well, uh, I, uh, to, I think if you, if you look at my last celluloid films, uh, Frame Up or The Bed You Sleep In. Um, or if you saw, I don't know, you see Uno and Ten, yes. uh, you can see me kind of rebelling against the constrictions of cinema. Mm. Uh, and I, I was doing things that, that most people would cost an arm and a leg, but I, I, I was doing it all in camera, so it didn't. It was very risky to do it in camera, but but um, it was, I was the, just the, the technical language that was available to me. Uh, you know, if you had millions of dollars to throw at, you know, an optical printing thing, then you could do it. But I didn't have that. Uh, and I feel like my last films definitely show me straining inside the constraints of celluloid. And when digital came along, suddenly all that just got blown away. Because you could do things in digital very easily. That you, that, that you, yes, you can do it. Some of them, not all of them. Some of them you can do in film, but but it costs you an arm and a leg. Huh. And um, so when digital came along, suddenly it allowed me to begin to use the language that I wanted to use earlier, but was constrained and not able to do, uh, even though you know, I did lots of what I could do in cinema. I just happened to be looking at, the, uh, at a frame from Angel City up on my thing that shows the jigsaw puzzle piece that was in Angel City, mm -hmm. which would be very easy to execute in in digital format. Anyway, so digital was very much a liberation, and more importantly, I mean, aesthetically, it was a, a, a complete liberation for me. I could do things that I had in my head that I simply had not the means to execute in, in celluloid, and suddenly I could do that. The other thing was it released me of ever having to talk about people, about money, hmm. you know, yeah. producer-type people. Uh, again, because yeah. if you wanted to, you could... Uh, I don't know, let's, my digital films, uh, even the ones with actors, my biggest budget so far has been $2,000. Mm. Because the actors don't get paid, of course. <laughs> I don't get paid, they don't get paid. The movie makes no money. <laughs> but but uh, and other mm. films have cost, you know, like, like one film, let's see, which is the name of it? The one I shot in Italy, La Lunga Ombra, which has some modest name actresses in it who were happy to work with me just for the fun of it. Uh, it cost me $50. Wow. 
Um, because that's how much the tape costs, right? <laughs> right. So it's about it's about the literally the, that technology, and it's um, well, it's, it's, it's about the well, it's a, it's a it's more than a double edged sword. It's about the technology. It's about the inexpense of the technology. Mm -hmm. It's also about the freedom the technology gives you to experiment around and do things that, like, in my in most of my cinematic films, my highest shooting ratio was two and a half to one. Not because I was rehearsing so much, but because because I just couldn't afford to do anything. I couldn't afford to say, oh, I'll shoot an eight to one ratio because I didn't simply did not have the money. A handful of like frame up a thirty five millimeter film oh. shot in what was that nineteen ninety three was a one to one shooting ratio. Hmm. Last chance for a slow dance was a one to one shooting ratio. Hmm. And a number of my film like I think the bed you sleep in was probably around two and a half to one. Their mirrors was two and a half to one, something in that ballpark. Mm -hmm. Other films were virtually one to one, like Slow Moves was virtually one to one. Then I got to making digital, and the cost of either experimenting more or taking another thing. I don't like to do retakes if I can avoid it, mm -hmm. because I think it, the, the acting loses something, especially if you're improvising. Or if I'm improvising and I didn't, I'm not happy with this, I don't want them to repeat the same thing. Mm -hmm. I'll say, okay, let's take it from another angle. Let's see if we can find another way to say this. And a mere not maybe another way to shoot it. Um, and so the digital became very liberating because of its minimal costs and because of its much more elastic aesthetic possibilities. And uh, the two together. Flip side is it also made it where everybody and his uncle can make a movie if they think they can. Hmm. So, so anything good in digital is going to be buried in a... Everest of shit. <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> and, uh, and so it makes it harder to be, break out of this, you know, massive oversaturation of really, truly awful movies, mm. which, you know, like, well, if, if you write to a festival now, and they'll send you back your rejection notice and say, we had 12,000 entries. Mm. Now, I guarantee you that 30 years ago, there would not have been 12,000 entries because mm. only a handful of people could figure out how to do it cheap enough or had the money to make a film. So, you know, 30 years ago, a festival would say, well, we had 300 entries. Now they say, we had 12,000. That's what the Sundance said last year. They had 12,000 entries. So, so the odds of... Even if you have the greatest film in the world and you said it, they're going to look at 12,000, I guarantee you nobody looked at all 12,000 of those. Mm. Not the lowest flunky in the totem pole at Sundance looked at those, right? And that's, um, that's the, yeah, so, it's, it's just so that, that's the other side of the digital. The virtue of the digital is that, yes, it allows you or anybody else to make whatever you want and with much greater freedom and elasticity and not having to worry about, I have to make a story that will get the money back to the producers, right? Now I can make it however I damn well please. I don't have to worry about getting money back to anybody. And uh, my, only, my moral worry for myself is I have to make something where the actors in it or the people involved in helping make it uh, are are happy they were in it. Mm. Yeah. And uh, that's that's my bottom line. That's right? your that's your well that's a well that makes sense because oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. And I just want you know if I'm asking people to work for nothing, which I am mm -hmm. And what I and I and I'm not gonna say, oh well, you get a percentage of my great profits. I tell them right up there, there's not gonna be any profits. There's not gonna be no sales. The thing is that I I'm gonna lose a little money for the bother of making this, right? And you're gonna lose something too. But you'll be hopefully in a movie you can look at and say, well, I'm glad I was in that movie as opposed to all the others. They might say, well, that was a piece of shit. <laughs> I, so, guess that, I guess that would include James Benning, who's known more as a filmmaker than an actor. Uh, and you cast him as a lead, right? Um, yes. And so... Well, uh -huh. he never acted in anything before. Yeah. He, I think he's acted in something since, but that was his first acting job. Mm -hmm. um, well, and it took me... It, it took 
two years in my bugging man for him <laughs> to actually look at the movie because he, A, he's not a movie watcher, mm. and apparently he doesn't feel comfortable watching himself. Mm. Um, but uh, he finally looked at it. He said, he, I think it was with one of his students at CalArts. He finally sat down and looked at it two years later. Mm. And, uh, uh, James is not a man of many words. Hmm. He's a very taciturn guy. And uh, usually an email from him will be three words and whatever question I answer. Anyway, uh, so he wrote back and said, an amazing film. That was all I know from him. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he did agree to be in my next film if I make one. Okay. I have a film that I think he would fit in. And he said, yes, he would be in. Is this because I'm he, he knows you. He, somebody told him that he's very good. <laughs> well, he, he is. <laughs> he is. Yeah. Um, and, uh, is, this, is this connected to the, what you're working on now in terms of uh, Bell Diamond, or is that another, is that not? Uh, a different from what I can tell right now, my philosophy about making anything these days is if, if, it's, if I'm not having fun or if it becomes in any way a hassle, I'm not interested. Hmm. Right? So it does just kind of fall together and be an enjoyable process for me and everybody else involved. I just say, oh, I don't need to do this. And right now the Bell Diamond thing is heading that way. So hmm. I, I'm doubtful we'll make it because I don't want to have to call people up three times to get them to respond. That's hmm. what I'm getting. And it's okay. I have no problems. It wasn't my idea to begin with. It was yeah. the idea of the people who aren't who aren't being responsive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so I don't. I, I don't. At least in whatever version we were thinking of, it's not going to happen. Uh, I'll probably make something here um, on the Berkeley Pit. You and, and coming to terms, there's some passages of the Berkeley Pit that are horizontal. Mm -hmm. Of watching this slow transitions. Well, I have I, uh, something where I'm going to flip that 90 degrees and have a, a more complex thing. And I have a woman in Seattle who's a very wonderful musician, and she will probably play cello for me, and I'll put together some kind of the industrial sounds of the pit, like a, a kind of symphonic scale, maybe 40 minutes of this thing going on. And I may be able to go to Yellowstone and shoot the landscape from there. Oh, um, wow. Although I just had a branch thrown in the works about that the other day, so that may not happen or it may. We'll see. And my next otherwise plotted film is something in the Seattle area. Okay. But like I say, at this point in my life, if it doesn't just sort of flow together in a happy way, if it requires any hassle or bother on my part or then I, don't, I have no compulsion to make anything <laughs> so if it's fun then I like to have fun if it's not fun then I'm not interested that's a, that's a pretty exacting standard so it's, you said that you had a moral so it's a moral obligation to, to the actors or, or models and and, um, and that would appear to be your, your you said that was your bottom line uh, so. Well, if I'm making something that involves other people, yes, right. it's, it's yeah. got to. And you know, and as soon as there's any difficulty, you know, there, right, uh, difficulty in getting to show up, difficulty, difficulty in working with them, difficulty of any kind, I say, well, I, don't, I really don't need to do this. <laughs> I have nothing to prove to anybody or myself. You know, if it's fun, I like to do it. If it's not fun, well, I can pass. Hmm. So is there anything else that comes to your mind about art in general or artists you admire or love or don't love or or, or art mediums? Because I, I know that you're very knowledgeable about the other mediums. I see that you write about painting and, and, and landscape painting and photography. And, and um, you've really Well, to me, they're, they're all essentially the same. Mm -hmm. The rules for them are all basically the same. It's basically music is just just... This painting, writing, they all have to do with uh, orchestrating things that contrast with each other mm -hmm. and, and how much you do or don't do that, how 
And the basic rules for all the arts seem to me to be basically the same. And then it depends on, well, what do you, what does somebody uh, have an aptitude for? Mm-hmm. What do they, you know, because oh, that's one thing I, I've had lots of, say, discussions, write-ins, whatever you want to call it, uh, with people who think that you can teach art. Mm-hmm. And I absolutely do not. I think mm-hmm. you can, you can develop in someone, um, someone who has the innate skill and talent, you can help develop that or you can quash it. Uh, but you can't turn someone who has no music in their, in their body into, to play music. Mm-hmm. And you can't make someone who's not visual be a painter or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so although I think all of those things are innate and you can either, either you do discover them all by yourself or if you can go someplace where it will be unveiled to you, look at this talent, and you can be developed or it can be squished. Mm. And uh, I don't know, my I seem to be, a, what do they call it, a multi, whatever. <laughs> You know, I'm visual. I think you know. I I think I could have made a living as a painter, a musician, <laughs> maybe you're, you're, you're certainly know, good enough. a writer. Oh yeah, I, I agree but with that. Just, I mean, that's really the philosophy of my entire show. It's funny that you. It's it's fitting that you're my first guest because my show is about all of the arts and that uh, all the arts are, are one, and that they're all there's a unity of them. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm I'm happy to hear you say that. Uh, that's uh that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, is there anything else you wanna you want to add or, or to this or anything else you wanna uh, uh, come to mind or about? Well, no. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know what else I could add. If you have something you you particularly want me to address, I can try. But no, I all I want to say is that I've loved ha- hearing you talk about this stuff because it's yeah. important. Because there's so much nonsense that gets talked about in movies and things, and, and it's I'm very thankful you're on the show to talk about it from the perspective of somebody who makes something, <laughs> as opposed to you know some of the nonsense that that's out there, you, get, you know, because that's what it's about. And, and I'm, I'm very thankful you you spent the time to do this when you came on the okay. of your career. I'm happy to do it. Uh, Parenthetically to the mm-hmm. side, when you haven't done, is there some way I post it on Facebook or whatever, or blog, to direct people to to it? We will absolutely do that when the show is when the show is edited and finished. We will, okay. we, will call, we will basically send everything to you, and okay. uh, you know it is yours in that in that sense, and and uh, we'll, that's the tech stuff, and we'll work that out. And but again, thanks for being here, and um, I really enjoyed this. This was a uh, I hope, I hope people listening got something out of it and learned something about life or art or both. So thank okay, you. well, my pleasure to be here. I want to hear you play some more music one of these days. Yes, that will happen. <laughs> that will happen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Broken down on the hallway Broken down on So fine, busted and broken, and I'm way past the line. Broken down on the hallway, broken down on the road. Well, I ain't got no car, and I don't feel so fine. Busted and I'm broken, and I'm way past the line. Thank mm-hmm. you.